Welcome to the Conscious Radio Network's YouTube channel. Become enlightened, have fun, and tell all your friends and family to share with everyone they know. You can find us on Facebook and stay up to date on our Facebook group or find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Our podcasts can be found on Libsyn, iHeart, Spotify, Google Podcast, and more. Most of all, remember to go to our official website at ConsciousRadioNetwork.com for podcasts, hosts, future shows, and scheduling. We also want to welcome our international audience. Don't stop now. Enjoy the community. Subscribe today. This is the Conscious Radio Network. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you might be on this spaceship we call Earth. Welcome to Conscious Radio Network's weekly podcast series, The Seance. I'm your host, Reverend Dr. Paul Meckes. If this is your first time, click subscribe, like, share, comment, and follow wherever you listen to your podcasts. Tonight, visiting us again, blessed with his presence, Archbishop Ron Phelan Wright joins us. If you've, if you've listened to some of our past shows, which, like I said, he's back again, um, doesn't need much of an introduction because he is the exorcist. <laughs> and, um, but he's, he's a retired demonologist who's worked, uh, worked at the Sacred Order of St. Michael the Archangel as part of the investigation and assessment team of demonologists, a veteran in the battle of good versus evil over 41 years, decided in 1982. To develop a systematic process for assessing and profiling people who claim demonic issues. The online demonic profiling studies and demon assessments take the next step towards or forward in demonic investigation studies with a mentorship program. Let's welcome back to the show Archbishop Ron Phelan Wright. <laughs> welcome back, Ron. And before I before I start, um, I have a quick poem that I wrote today, and um, because of the Halloween season and um, because of what we're talking about, I'm sure you'll you'll uh, you'll like this one. And it goes as this: As the sun goes down today, in awe we admire and pray. The angels guard our doors so that we may see another day. That came to me so quickly today when I was. It, the sun wasn't going down quite yet, but it seems like every time the sun goes down at the end of each day, there's this energy that fills our spaces that we should be guarded. And it seems like the angels do guard us. And with the work that you do as, um, as an exorcist, and the, which we will be talking about tonight, um, how, and for those who didn't see the first broadcast, let's let's do a little bit of a recap of okay. of of your work. Sure. Well, I could start. Uh, I'll give you a, a quick summary from the very beginning. Um, my whole experience in the very beginning started off with a supernatural experience. Uh, it was quite interesting. Um, in the Catholic Church, we have these various sacraments and ceremonies that we follow. Um, after First Holy Communion, we have uh, what's referred to as confirmation. And keep in mind, I'm uh, maybe 9, 10, 11 years old. <laughs> That's a long time ago. And um, I was in church. This was in Brooklyn, New York. I'm from, as you know, from back east. Um, mm -hmm. And my mother brought me to church. It was my Holy Communion. And as I approached the, the altar step in the, uh, in the old Catholic churches, we have the rail just before the altar. And people who are going to receive communion, uh, that's that, the wafer that's that, that the priest has in his hand, places it on your tongue. And, uh, and this is part of our ritual. Um, well, as a result, um, as I was approaching the rail, for another church something very strange happened my mom is sitting 
she's sitting uh, in the front pew, pew, and she's like right there. She could see everything, and and she's looking because it's my first uh, you know confirmation. Uh, <laughs> uh, and as a result, um, as I approached the altar or the rail, the uh, the priest came and offered the host, and and just as he approached me, he did something that you don't ever really ever see. Yeah. He tripped over his feet. The host that he was going to offer me flew in the air and he just stumbled just before and as he was reaching the rail. Uh, everyone in the church, you know, they looked up, they noticed. Some people stood up because they thought the priest hurt himself uh, when he yeah. fell towards the rail. My mom got up after the, uh, of course, the priest regained uh, his composure. And then he replaced the host with another. And then I had my communion. And as I uh, retreated back uh, to the church and then I sat next to my mom, she asked me, she says, Ronnie, I have never, ever seen that ever happen. Do you have any take as to what's going on? Now, you have to understand, my mother, God rest her soul, she passed away several years ago. Yeah. Um, she's um Italian, <laughs> and uh, and she uh, she's very religious, brought up in the Catholic Church, um, and she, when she uh, joined the Depression, uh, she was raised in a Catholic orphanage in upstate New York, and so and she believed in the supernatural. She always believed in spiritual things, mm. and when she witnessed that, you know, and having her son go through this interesting and and kind of bizarre, you know, uh, event that took place. Um, she took notice and she knew that this was not your everyday, you know, run of the mill type of <laughs> uh, situation, you know, where yeah. the priest is going to literally fall off his feet and the host is flying in the air and, you know, and he's trying to regain his composure and everyone uh, in the parish, they just simply, you know, reacted. Uh, and so she asked me, she turned to me and she says, Ryan, do you understand what just took place? Do you, what, what are your impressions? And I told her, I don't really know. Okay. And again, you know, I'm like 10 years old. Don't yeah. really know. Um, but I remember the, the whole episode as it was yesterday. Wow. A year later, I was in the bathroom taking a shower. And this is another supernatural event that took place where I now acknowledge it, recognize it for what it is, and understand that there's an actual... Uh, journey that I have to follow. Um, I'm in the shower, uh, 11 years old, and uh, this bright, bright light blasted into the bathroom. The whole bathroom illuminated. I mean, it was so bright. I shut my eyes. It was like a big flash. I shut my eyes tightly, and then at that time, my eyes are closed for about 30 seconds or so. I saw myself many years later. Uh, you know, sometime in the future, and I was in a, uh, a clergy shirt. I was in uh, serving in some capacity in the church. Yeah. And I keep in mind, I'm only 11 years old, and I'm watching all of this, a total fascination. Um, and then as I slowly opened my eyes, there was still a mist in the bathroom that slowly dissipated and went right out the window. Mm. And everything went back to normal. Since that time, I, I came to understand that there are things in this world that we have to accept. Uh, and, and to totally ignore it would be kind of crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. to, to ignore it would be, it would be a, a disservice to your very being because, you know, there are so many things that happen in our lifetime that we need to embrace and, and try to make the best of, of everything. I went through the the whole process. I went through the theological training. I was uh, received holy orders, which is the uh, ordination into the priesthood. Yeah, and uh, and this was in the mid seventies, a long time ago. And then uh, I approached my jurisdictional bishop and asked him about the ministry in exorcism. And I had three mentors, but the one of the three was an actual experienced exorcist. And he was this old guy who became my mentor, and I became his assistant. So I assisted the exorcist for at least four years. Wow. And uh, in that four-year time, um, 
I was finally appointed as a jurisdictional exorcist. And, uh, and at that time, um, that was like 1980. And, and then I became, um, uh, about in 81, I was bishop elect. And in 82, I was consecrated as a Catholic bishop. And at that point, I, um, along with so many things I've, I've, I haven't even touched on, I'm going to review some of the stories, okay? Uh, yeah. What happened during the time when I was the assistant to the exorcist, and that like a four-year training program, that's on the job. That's the only way you could truly be appointed as an exorcist, yeah. is to yeah. be appointed by your peers, be appointed within a church structure, and you yeah. have to be elected and appointed to that position. And that was going to be my question, too, because, I mean, not any... Not any priest. I mean, it's it's a calling. It takes a calling because I don't say any priest could, could be, go out there and just do this. You have to have the guts and the calling to do it. Well, you know, it's not like going to the uh, the uh, state employment office and applying for a job. Yeah. <laughs> Where somebody <laughs> makes a decision and say, "Well, I don't know if you're qualified, but let's look at your resume." Mm -hmm. No, this is when you get uh, when your employer happens to be the creator of the universe, and he knocks on your door, and he gives you a vision, if you will, and invites you to become part of something much bigger than oneself. When that happens, you know you have to pay attention. And I yeah. was only 11 years old when I got the call. And that was my calling, 11 years old. When I have clergy that join my organization, uh, I always ask them, I say to them, and these are priests, some of them are bishops. I say to them, tell me a story. Tell me about your calling. You know, it should be something that's incredible. It should be something that will uh, knock you off your feet. And that is something that will continue to be with you as a as part of who you are and as part of your way of expression. Yeah. And uh, so I've always, I always ask the priests that are joining us, um, tell me your experience. Why do you want to be an exorcist? Were you called? Were you called divinely? You see, there are people that are clergy and there are people that are not trained and there are people who are, haven't been called, but they go through the motions, they read the words, they read the ceremony, they read the whole ritual. And, um, and the odds are of them being successful is, you know, 20, 80 or something. I mean, in terms of not being successful. The yeah. uh, reason being is because you have to have the, the backing of the Holy Spirit. You have to have the backing of God uh, and to have that calling. Now, I'm not saying that, that they would not be 100% successful. I'm sure they, sure they would. But if you want to be really, truly successful, you should always go with your calling. Yeah. Okay. Some people are called to be a plumber. Some people are called to be a electrician or a carpenter. Some people are called into the ministry, but the ministry, like all the other trades, if you will, there's specialties. You know, you have to be a specialist. If you just concentrate on this alone, we have uh, clergy that are tied to parishes, and they are uh, they have uh, they have their duties as a parish priest. Okay, and that's one thing, and that's wonderful. But it takes that special person who is called by God to be appointed and have your peers actually elect you to a position after your training. And, and this training doesn't come in, uh, from a seminary. It, it comes from on-the-job training with a mentor, a mentor yeah. who could uh, be with you in every aspect of the way, and they become basically your spiritual director. They tell you and, and show you, and they approve of the things that you have to go through in life when, as you are following your calling. Anyway, uh, back in 82, I designed, and keep in mind, too, I've did hundreds, at, even at that time, hundreds of actual rituals, even before the time I was elected to a bishop-elect. I've already had hundreds of uh, rituals under my belt. Wow. And even as an assistant or at the actual ex being the lead. Um, so keeping that in mind, I decided to sit down and come up with an analytical uh, process that will help us evaluate, make our evaluations based on assessments, uh, based on what could be provided in regards to tangible proof. 
that we're going through or we're experiencing something that's totally supernatural and beyond a shadow of a doubt. There are a lot of people out there that have and fall into many categories. And unfortunately, to experience something that's actual genuine, a genuine, true demonic issue, okay, it was a, this would be something that will not only uh, get your attention, but you would have to immediately respond to the individual. Mm-hmm. When I say immediately respond, it's not an overnight thing. Our assessment process takes anywhere from three to six months. And most people are shocked when they hear that. But the reason being is we're dealing with the human element. The, we're dealing with the person that has so many different facets of, of, of themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, we're dealing with the, the mental issues, the physical issues, and the, the physical manifestations that are taking place within that person's life. And at that point, if they are truly and truly have demonic issues, they are at their worst. They are suffering physically. They're suffering, uh, suffering mentally. They're going through so many issues. Um, the wear and tear of their very existence is starting to show. A lot of people who are actually and have a verifiable demonic possession, um, they don't look like themselves. They have yeah. a different appearance. Um, if you have ever been in a morgue, okay, you'll see that there's not a whole lot of life in there. <laughs> Reason being is uh, they're no longer there, but their bodies are. And if you examine their bodies, you'll see that their bodies are off, off color. There's an off coloration that's involved in the texture of the skin. You will touch them and they'll be ice cold. There's no blood circulation. There's no heat that's being generated from the body. They're totally and completely cold. And it's like if they're in an ice box, okay? And then you look at their coloring. Sometimes it's a gray in color. And you look at that. You're not only looking at somebody who is a classified and, and we review as a cadaver, but you're also looking at something that might be possessed yeah. in a demonic form, format. And, of course, I'm referring to demonic possession. If a person is truly possessed, they will show physical signs of the wear and tear of the body that they're dragging around and being in this horrible, terrible position. As I said, it's the mental and the physical anguish that you could see. You could actually see just by looking at a person. Um, I go into details when we go into making a full clinical assessment in regards to, uh, to viewing the demonic. We have to look at the little things that most people would be totally oblivious to. Yeah, and that's uh, what I was going to ask is what are the signs? You know, yeah. I like for some like, of our listeners, they're probably going to get, well, what are, what, what should I look for? Like, I think my coworkers demonically possessed and it's like, what are the very first things that are kind of triggers and not to me, not to say, oh, they are, but just to, you know, kind of be aware. Well, um, first of all, there's a, I'm, I'll go through the whole list all right. and it's quite extensive. Okay, uh, but uh, I'll cover the uh, the physical, the psychological, and also the physical manifestations that might be taking place uh, within the uh, victim space or within their environment, which could also be a possible demonic infestation, which is a an, an area where many demonic entities could be housed and and sharing your space. And when that happens, uh, a lot of things happen to your immediate surroundings. Yeah, and then uh, and of course that could lead to other things, and uh, we can go into that in a little little while if you wish. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but let's go into the signs, okay? Um, the the first obvious sign would be um, uh, isolation. Uh, they would be uh, somewhere in the corner of their room, um, not requiring any type of human contact. They're totally completely isolated. Um, they become antisocial. And then we go even further into that. We further into look at the individual. Um, one telling sign is they won't blink. Mm. Their eyelids will not blink. You know, most people, you know, in fact, all people, you know, you have to blink your eyes at least once every 30 seconds just to yeah. lubricate the eyeball. <laughs> when you're not blinking at all and it's just a stare, you know, it's very alarming and uh, it's very telling. Yeah. Um, hair coloring could change. Hair color would have changed uh, like almost overnight. Um, the, uh, the the warmth of the body and personality of the person would be absent. 
Okay, um, that would be a, a telling sign. They have the ability to look at anyone in the room and point to someone and actually tell them exactly what all their hidden secrets are and they will just say it out loud. They will talk about your past events. They'll talk about things you've done yesterday. And, and it will be amazing because it will be so accurate, very yeah. frightening. Um, hmm. And, and um, it's like, you know, the average person going to their therapist, you know, they're, they're a little bit hesitant. You know, they don't really want to reveal their secrets per se. But just think, if you go to somebody who actually already knows your secrets, <laughs> that could be really, whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then uh, well, I'm going to go into the mild to the most extreme, okay, symptoms here. Okay. The energy, the super negative energy that's radiating from the body will actually um, put out a scent, an odor. Mm. Uh, rotten eggs, most people would say. But for me, since I know what dead flesh smells like, that's what I see and that's what I sense is dead flesh. So what I'm looking at is I'm looking at a person who may be still alive and still you know, in our realm of existence, but but they're demonstrating all the signs of a corpse. Hmm. And even that is very disturbing. So you'd smell the stench. The stench is so, oh gosh, it's, it's just so, it's so strong and, and you could almost smell it outside the room. And yeah. that's how strong it is. If, um, and some people may have had this experience if they've had a loved one or someone they know who's passed on and, um, and they enter their apartment or room and, and they did, they had no idea that they passed on, but they could yeah. smell them. And there's that scent. Um, and um, it's very, very telling. Okay, now we're going to the physical aspects. Okay, um, this texture of the skin will also change. Um, they, some cases, ha will morph into something else. When I say morph into something else, I mean actual complete and some of this is going to sound unbelievable but it's true yeah. um they can morph into another person they can morph into a female male wow. to a female and Shakes female back freaking. to a male exactly and uh yeah. even a reptile even representing some kind of reptile um it scales from everything from their eyes could change to a solid white to a solid black wow okay and when that happens that's only the you know the the mild uh, signs of possession. But um, some physicians will tell you and psychiatrists will tell you that, you know, um, through our science, all these things could be explained medically or even psychologically. Okay. Um, and so as a result, you know, there's nothing really supernatural here. Everything could be explained. And of course, unfortunately, um, you know, this is the belief system, even in some of the churches, I have to tell you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, some of the, some of the pastors will tell you, well, you know, demons and demonic possession, you know, the, all that happened 2000 years ago. And that was before the science came in, you know, before we had psychiatry, before we, uh, we actually had physicians that would actually examine you and, uh, <laughs> and, and medically, you know, and chemically examine you and come up with some kind of justification as to why uh, you're acting a certain way. You know, and so you have all those people. And as I said, unfortunately, some of them are clergy uh, and some of them are pastors of churches. And, and they preach about all the things that Christ has done. They preach about the Gospels. They preach about the New Testament, the Old Testament. All this fine, but they don't really cover demons or demonic possession uh, mm -hmm. or the telling signs. And yet uh, they are believe it or not, in the scriptures. I mean, it tells, it gives us all the answers. Sometimes people say that the scriptures are open for interpretation, but when you are following your journey, your interpretation, I'd say it almost 100% is pretty accurate because that's exactly what God wants you to be doing and, and leads you to the right path. Yeah. Getting back to the symptoms. Um, one of the other symptoms is super strength. Having the ability to throw someone three, four hundred pounds across the room with one arm. Mm -hmm. uh, very uh, impressive, okay? Especially when these people are bouncing off the walls as a result of how strong the strength that's being displayed. It's, it's unbelievable. Okay, another thing, um, again, 
some people could explain to say, well, you know, maybe this is a physical thing. Maybe the person's on drugs. Maybe he's on PCP, and you know, which you know is known to give them super strength and, and to ignore. Uh, a few years ago, I don't know if you recall this or not, in Florida, of all places, there was a guy that was on uh, bath salt and he was eating his face. Yeah, a lot, yeah, that? Miami. It was in Miami. I remember that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And so you know, so so you have these uh, these practitioners that will tell you, well, they're on drugs. You know, that's why you know they're they're behaving in such a fashion. I believe that this person was demonically influenced. Drugs may have maybe touched off and started the whole scenario, but then at that point, demonic oppression just seeped in, and as a result, this all this behavior, this bar bizarre behavior, is. Uh, See, it's another thing, too. If you place yourself in a defenseless mode, okay, where, you're, where your, your natural defenses are down because you, you've digested some, um, some mood-altering drugs, you know, you somehow sedated yourself. When you do that, all your natural uh, and spiritual, okay, pointers are down. Yeah. And as a result, you are more influenced uh, to... Basically, be open to all the dark things that are out there. And believe me, the demonic is just waiting for some person to be that stupid to put themselves. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like walking in front of traffic and waiting for a car to hit you, or or you know, or standing in front of a train. Whatever the scenario is, it's suicide. Yeah. And so, as a result, you know, the medical community will try to explain it. Well, it's a chemical imbalance. Okay, maybe brought on by some form or some substance, or maybe it's a natural chemical imbalance, you know. Uh, maybe it's schizophrenic. Maybe the guy has a paranoid uh, uh, schizophrenic. Maybe he has a, a, all kinds of, of psychosis. And yet, I always question, well, what brought that person to that point in their life where they lost control? I mean, what actually brought them from point A to point B? Where's the cause and effect? Yeah. Are we going to say totally it's the substance, or what? What made the individual um, be compelled to to do that type of substance to begin with? Is it just to escape reality? Maybe to sedate themselves from the reality of the world, and and just you know, there's a lot of issues that go on here. But the demonic, all the negative energy in the world, will take advantage of that. If you lose point as to what your main purpose is all about, and you start looking for shortcuts. And I hate to say it, there's no such thing as shortcuts. Everything, okay, um, is there, and, and you have to take it for what it is. Yep. Okay, getting back to um, some of the other symptoms, okay. Uh, physicians might describe all the things I've just mentioned. They might describe and say, well, you know, these things could be chemically induced. How about walking on walls or on a ceiling? Okay, I'm going to get to that now. <laughs> Okay, now the ones now the ones that that, that really uh, that I could say really classified as supernatural events, such as uh, levitation. Somebody asked me, um, in fact, not too long ago, have I ever witnessed levitation? Well, honestly, I've been in this ministry for forty six years, and I'm going to say, out of a thousand cases, you might find one that's genuine and totally full demonic mode hmm. and i could tell you that i have seen it in 46 years i've seen it and i'm talking about thousands of cases i have seen it probably about 12 times that's 12 times that's wow. the uh, number after 11 and just before 13 12 times i make it very clear because people will say well, he said he saw it a few times. No, I did not see it a few times. I saw it 12 times. Uh, interesting number, 12. In any case, um, yeah, I, I've seen someone levitate and actually hit the ceiling. I've seen someone who was stuck on the wall, literally above and stuck on the wall for hours and didn't come down. Wow. And no matter what we did, I it was there. My, uh, I had two assistants who were priests, and I had uh, a seminarian, and I had uh, a few investigators. We were all in the room, and we were like totally, of course, we, at the time we didn't have iPhones or, you know, we couldn't really. That's what I was going to ask you. Have you ever been able to, yeah, yeah. to video uh, record any of this? I, what I've done is uh, 
because of the uh, the confidentiality and the anguish the person has to go through i mean yeah. it's it's torturous it would be something uh, and most people will not open up or, or even reach out to us unless we guarantee full confidentiality which is extremely important Mm -hmm. But uh, I've taken uh, photographs, I've taken, you know, stuff like that that have been submitted to me by other uh, uh, investigators and, uh, and clergymen and so on. And I used to have my whole space. I had a whole room full of files over 40 years of cases. I uh, understand my position is not, you know, I'm not just the, the person that goes out in, uh, for these calls. I'm the chief exorcist for this organization where we have literally clergy in 24 countries around the world. And what they do is they have their team of assessments uh, they, where they do assessments. They are, uh, so as a result, they investigate these individuals when they, when the victim contacts the church, contacts one of our jurisdictions, okay, then we send out a team to investigate. The team goes out and interviews the victim for the very first time. And the whole interview process is about an hour or two, but we have it recorded. We have photographs taken of the environment of the victim himself, and we look for physical manifestations that may take place in the house. And that could, um, we could talk about that too. I mean, that's all, there's a lot of physical things that could happen in the house. Yeah. Uh, and when the victim is no longer the person, but the victim is the house, the house is being victimized by all this dark entities, things start happening. And I'm not talking about uh, paint peeling off the walls. I'm talking about other things like foreign substances that can actually seep, the, you know, the walls will seep from this substance. Yeah. Um, we had a team that went out and witnessed um, but looked like blood coming down, literally blood. It wasn't blood, though, but it looked like blood, and it was coming down from the ceiling, and it was trickling down. And uh, and this investigator and his team, they were able to get a sample of what the material was. Now, this is where, you know, we, we start analyzing everything, and we use this, this a a analytical process to do this. Uh, when there's something that we can't explain what it is, then, of course, you know, we have to... Uh, try to find someone who can explain. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we, uh, we basically uh, group our thoughts together and we try to come up with a solution. Uh, and a lot of my our clergy, they, uh, in the recent past, they had uh, contacted me in, in this regards. The substance that was gathered after the lab, you know, went through the substance, found out that it was water and human Plasma. <laughs> plasma is a substance that's, that's taken from the blood and it's used for, for hemophiliacs, actually. Yeah. So it's very, uh, in any case, for re some weird reason, it was coming down the walls. Huh. And uh, that was in a demonic infestation. And when that happens, other things happen where the walls start vibrating, things start flying across the room. And, and uh, one uh, interesting story i'll make it real short because i want to go on with the uh, other things that you could you could look for i was doing a ritual and it was in a skid row hotel um uh, most of my ministry i say maybe 30 years of my ministry was catering to indigents people who would call me people who own these hotels would call me and say something's happening in my building i can't explain it you know there's banging on the walls and uh, and I had my maintenance people look at it, and there's nothing there, and yet it's banging. Uh, two o'clock in the morning, two to three o'clock, there's always someone screaming, screaming down the. You could hear the echo of these screaming uh, uh, sounds, and and everyone hears it, you know. Um, and so as a result, we talk about every floor, you know, in, in some of these buildings, uh, these some of these skid hotels are like ten stories, eleven stories. Everyone hears the screaming. And, and there's no central, one central location. It's coming from all angles. It's coming from all the walls. Yeah. The scream is actually being produced. Now, it's not, it has nothing to do with the acoustics, um, though one would try to explain, you know, that it probably is. But it's, it, in this case, when you start hearing something and it's coming from all everywhere. the walls, everywhere in the building. Yeah. 
Funny thing is, when it occurs, nobody hears the sounds outside the building. Huh. It's only inside the building. So you'll hear the echo sound, screaming and hollering. As soon as you walk outside, it's quiet. Yeah. <laughs> There's like no disturbance whatsoever. Uh, and it's uh, that's when you know that there's something going on. And so I would have these these uh, building owners, landlords, uh, hotel owners contact me and report the disturbance, that type of uh, disturbance. Sometimes if it's somebody that uh, some person that's living in one of these hotels, and keep in mind, most of the people, the residents in these hotels, they're either uh, – they're the low end of, of society where most people would view them. They're either uh, uh, financially strapped. Uh, they may have mental, psychological issues going on. Some of them are substance abusers. And um, some of them are have clinical depression. There's so many, a multitude of, of problems. Yeah. And I'll, these are the people that are open to all the darkness that's in the world. And people that are uh, from substance abuse, alcoholics, um, people who have just uh, chronic depression. Um, these are people even back in the 20s and 30s, they would jump out from the top floor of the hotels mm -hmm. and they would jump and they would uh, commit suicide as a result. So in these buildings you have, uh, and there's over 200 of them in, in, in the downtown area that I'm referring to, um, they have, and these, all these buildings are over 100 years old. Okay, so I mean, they're old, they've been around for a long time. Um, but there's so much, and so much history of um, supernatural things taking place. And most people are totally oblivious because of a number of things. Number one, um, they don't believe it. They can't believe it, you know, they've never witnessed it, so it, it must not exist. You know, um, it's the supernatural, the paranormal, how could that ever exist? Because, you know, let's face it, uh, yeah. we in society, we've never really experienced it. So how, we have nothing to cross-reference it to. So how do we know it's real, right? <laughs> but the reality is um, that there's a lot of things that are that are so real that you may never experience physically and see it, but you'll feel it. And when it touches your life, you'll know. You'll go into a state of confusion. Some people actually have mental breakdowns when they encounter the supernatural firsthand for the very first time. Uh, and they can't explain it, at least not mentally. And as a result, you know, they're, they're placed in a corner where they lose it. They, they lose all forms of reality because they fixate on the experience. And then yeah. they wind up in mental institutions. They wind up in, in victims, people who, who commit suicide. Um, they, you know, there's so many horrible things that take place. And unfortunately, um, the mainstream of society, they exist with blinders on. They are focused on only what happens and what affects them personally. Okay, If something happens outside of that realm of, of, of vision, um, they just won't um, acknowledge it because they can't relate to it. When you relate to something personally, that leaves a, a permanent mark on the cortex of your brain, and you know that it's part of you for the rest of your life. Any kind of trauma that you go through in life, okay, um, it will stick to you, and it will form your personality. It performs your, per it will re re uh, form your perspective in what you believe is reality. And yeah. when that happens, your perspective changes and you become a totally altered person than before you experience the actual trauma. And this is what happens when people are confronted and they uh, interact with the darkness. Guess what happens? Their eyes are open. The blindness slowly recede. Okay, from the sides, and they start seeing things. The more information that you see, and you can confirm as it being real, and your awareness goes up as well, the more exposed you become to the darkness, because it's no longer something that's, you know, a myth. It's no longer a rumor. It's no longer something a third party is talking about. What it is, basically, is it becomes part of your reality. So your reality is part of of what's actually going on. Um, there's a great movie I, I saw uh, and I love called The Matrix. 
Uh, and the simulation, the yeah. simulation of, you know, of what's actually going on. Nobody really knows that they live in the matrix. Okay. Until you, until it comes down to that very real thing that you become aware of the real world, if you will. Mm -hmm. The real world in, in our view is more than what we could understand. It's beyond our comprehension. We could do one or two things. We could either ignore something that is outside our comfort zone and hopefully uh, by not acknowledging it, uh, we're able to survive and, and go on, you know. Uh, but uh, the reality is, is that this only happens to the majority of the people who are unwilling to be open to the to these things. And if you are open to these things, you better educate yourself really and truly. Yeah. One of the things that I do, I mean, and I do this religiously, so to speak. Um, one of the, I, I make sure that I'm protected. I mean, I'm protected spiritually as well as physically. I am not the kind of person that will jump on on uh, on the tracks and wait for the train to to run me over. I will not. I refuse to do that. But yet there are people that will, and these people, um, they're being told in their inner mind that this is something you need to do. You're at the end of your rope. Mm. There is no hope for you. So the best thing to do is to end it all and just give in, just give up. Yeah. It takes more effort to climb a flight of steps than it does to walk down a flight of steps. You make that extra effort to climb up those steps, you're finding yourself in a more protective mode. If you totally give up and you find yourself running down a flight of steps, it's very easy to fall. And the odds yeah. are you will fall. This and is almost like uh, the same type of group of people that out of – and these are the very curious people. These are the people that will just – because they have that curiosity all the time, dabbling into supernatural crafts or magic or the Ouija board or ah, casting spells. I mean, when you get people that don't know really what they're doing, but they're doing it out of curiosity, and then they kind of go a little too far. Yeah, well, you know, when you open that door, it's, it's pretty hard to close it, especially yeah. when you're being enticed, you know. <laughs> and, and what's enticing you is, is, uh, is possibly knowledge, possibly enhancing your natural abilities. Uh, that's the enticer. And, and the enticer comes and is promoted by the darkness. The darkness will try to distract you whatever and any way it can. It will try to distract you. And if you're distracted, then uh, you're not paying attention to what you're supposed to be doing. And, and your safety is, is out the door. You're no longer in a familiar environment. You are outside that realm of protection. So you have a darkness that is that's just waiting to come in, whether it be through uh, demonic oppression where the blackness, the darkness of evil will plant a seed in your mind. And your mind is always open to new things. Yeah. Uh, the reason that we look, we, we, we enjoy ourselves in movies and theaters and TV and, and, and our time online is because we're learning. We're learning new things. We're, we're, we're entertaining not only ourselves uh, in a mental uh, aspect, but we're also being but we're also being to a point where we're learning other things, maybe other things that we're not, you know, had no intention of learning. Um, there's subliminal messaging going on in everything that you watch, especially if it's online. You have oh, no absolutely. idea. You have no idea what you're actually inviting into your space, even mentally. And mm -hmm. sometimes that darkness has a history of using the Internet, using all forms of, of, of technology to introduce itself to you and to make it appealing. Some people may fall into the, uh, you know, into the area of, um, of physical gratification where they actually need to watch pornography. Again, you know, very appealing. Everybody loves pornography. Really? Well, okay. But that's certainly a distraction. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's so many things. I mean, and I'm not saying this, you know, as you know, I, I'm 70 years old. Uh, and as a 70-year-old man, I never thought I'd make it this far. But as a 70-year-old, I can tell you right now, there's so much stuff that's out there that's just garbage. Yeah. Where you can yeah. 
take it as as bubblegum for the mind. It, it doesn't improve yourself. If anything else, it, it tears you down. It tears you down mentally, physically, and before you know it, if you allow it, it will drive you to a point of suicide or mental uh, delusion or, or whatever it, you know it may be. Uh, dealing with the demonic, dealing with supernatural things, dealing with the darkness, um, it's all real. And whether a person accepts that form of reality is uh, totally upon that. We, I can't wake people up. I can only yell out in the darkness and say, hey, you know, there's more out there. You're, in a, you're standing in this dark room and you don't see anything around you. But I'm yelling at the door, at, at the door frame. I'm yelling from the door. And I'm saying, hey, danger. You know, and then, uh, you know, the theme song to um, Jaws, you know, the uh, <laughs> that's exactly what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> you know, uh, you're in danger or, or, the, or lost in space. Will Robinson, you know, uh, oh, you know yep. danger, Will Robinson, you know, um, of course, the all the young people have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, I, I, I remember that one. People okay. are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I do. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's uh, it sometimes becomes part of uh, what's going on in, in your mind, and your mind controls your body. And that's that's an interesting thing too. And I I I I have conversations about this every now and then. Is the mind can be very powerful, but at the same time, it's a double edged sword. It can be, it's a it is a very weak tool that can be manipulated and is manipulated all the time. And I think they know that physical and non-physical beings know that. So it's like we, you know, and what are your thoughts on that? We have to be careful. Well, yeah, sometimes um, we're not, uh, the way we're made up, uh, we may not have that ability to be careful. We may, well, we, uh, you know, we have a tendencies of falling all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not just talking about resisting gravity. I'm talking about falling in every aspect of your life. I mean, we all have to uh, learn our lesson. Sometimes, unfortunately, uh, you have to go through a bad experience to learn that lesson. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, those people who have nothing going on in their life in regards to negativity, those people who are just totally happy and, and enjoy life as it is, they are either one or two people. They are either sitting on a bed in an insane insidal, um and, and locked up for life because they're insane. Mm -hmm. They have lost touch with reality. Yeah. Um, but they're content. You may not know that. They may be screaming, hollering, tearing their clothes off, uh, doing all kinds of despicable things to themselves, um, mutilating themselves, whatever. But in their inner mind, they're content because they have no idea what's going on. They just mm -hmm. feel it's part of the, uh, it's all part of the, you know, the, the whole scenario. Yeah. And then you have the other people who are aware of what's going on. And as a result, um, they could still uh, fall into some form of psychosis because they are aware. Okay, mm -hmm. then you have people who are very paranoid because they are aware. Their paranormal becomes part of their uh, awareness. And so as a result, you know, they're, they're just moping around. Um, and you have people like us, you know, who are uh, pretty much know what uh, what to do in the event a train is on on its way and we're standing on the tracks you know we know how to, you know we know to jump out of the way yeah i hope so anyway <laughs> and uh, and many people who are listening are probably have the same sense you know they're not going to put themselves in danger unfortunately many people who are we're talking about uh, they're already in danger because they've they've already gone beyond that that safety zone okay their minds have been manipulated to uh, to be focused more on themselves and their immediate environment and to follow their impulse. Yeah. Uh, there are people I've met who are been possessed and uh, who have uh, who appear to have a, a mental illness uh, uh, associated with cutting themselves. Uh, and they're known as cutters, you know, they, they cut their flesh, you know, and, and things of this nature. Um, but we're under the opinion, and I'm talking about we as clergy, we're under the opinion that the uh, you know, that they're not in full control at all. In mm -hmm. fact, to the contrary, the darkness 
of not only their behavior, but comes from a more sin sinister uh, source, if you will. And this is where Satan is, uh, he is manipulating everyone, and he has full control down here. Unless you know what the rules are, <laughs> unless you know where to follow and, and what to do, uh, you're putting yourself in danger, in yeah. tremendous danger. Yeah. Um, but do you believe in curses? Oh, yeah. Sure. I believe what in curses. I believe in generational, there's generational curses. There's, uh, <clears throat> of course, yes, yes. Yeah, curses are, it's part of the darkness, it's part of allowing the, the darkness to manipulate your thoughts and your actions, yeah. and uh, especially hurting someone. You want to hurt someone, you want to you want to put them in a negative state of mind and body, um, and to do that, there's many ways to do it, there's many formulas, there's uh, people that do practice the dark arts, uh, and the, the outcome of that uh, would be curses, uh, that could be affecting uh, individuals. So, oh, yes. In fact, we even have rituals. We have a ritual that actually breaks, you know, the generational curse scenario. Got to remember that we have, we as human beings, you know, our whole ancestry goes way back to the uh, to the days where a human sacrifice was uh, was something that was accepted. You know. Oh you yeah. Do yeah. certain things. Um, also, you know, I mean, and I'm not talking about, you know, too long ago, too long, even the 15th century, you know, and, and as a result, you know, that thing drags on. I mean, then you have other cultures uh, in the Middle East or, or the gypsies, as they used to call them, which uh, still exist, you know, and they don't give it the evil eye. <laughs> and they'll, they'll, they'll do all kinds of, of diabolical things. But, of course, the power is not coming from them. It's coming from dark influences of the world yeah yeah, so, and then, yeah, you got, yeah. And then you got the, the good influences you got you know you got the good magic and you got the black magic and it all depends on how you use it you know Every, if, you, if you're gonna has... cast a, yeah if you're gonna cast a spell on somebody i'd rather it be a good spell and not have to harm anybody in in the result of it yeah it all boils down to what your what your belief system is you know um to me uh Casting spells for any reason, um, it, to me, I think it's a waste of energy and time. Yeah. Um, I mean, why try to manipulate someone else's life, whether it's good or bad? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not really our role to do that. Yeah. Um, I I rather um, I rather count on on sources that are above my pay grade. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Such like, as you know, like, yeah, like meditating or praying for somebody, and in and. To be honest, I think that that's also a spell, but it's you're asking that's a ritual. You know, the Lord, and you're asking for God to be able to come in and assist on the help. Yeah, as I said, you know, it depends on your perception. Yeah. Um, I think that um, that uh, driving nails uh, in a doll or, or pins or whatever it's done in voodoo, I, I think that uh, I, I think that's real. I think that, I think that uh, playing with Ouija boards and using it with intent, mm -hmm. I believe that's also real. I believe you could open up portals to uh, different dimensions. I believe you could also open vortexes into into the dark entities yeah. that are in the world. I believe when you use tools or instruments such as that, and you have an intent to use it to invite something into your space, I think it, it will happen. And yeah. will it be good? Not necessarily. I think that uh, even in the scriptures, it tells us, you know, the, the demons, the demonic, the Satan himself knows how to disguise himself. Uh, and he will use your memories, use your experiences against you. And it will, yeah. uh, it will, um, you will welcome them because you'll see someone who is your friend who has been with you since, you know, since you were a baby. I mean, you grew up with this individual. You know this individual. You think you do. Your memory goes all the way back to knowing this person when you were just a child. The reality is maybe that child is, doesn't really exist. Maybe that child is just an image that the darkness created solely for you, planted a seed in your mind, in your subconscious, where you are... Uh, gravitating to false memories of someone who's not really there. 
Yeah. You know, um, who was it? Um, I believe it was, um, it was Einstein. He had, uh, he had companions that were not there. Hmm. He had, um, he had, uh, he would socialize with these, um, unentities, uh, un people, the no, characters were not there. They were just, uh, something that he saw. He, he would see them, see them physically, see them bodily, yeah. interact with them, talk to them, joke with them, socialize with them. And yet, um, not until it was pointed out to him by other, you know, colleagues that, uh, do you, are you aware that you're talking to yourself? Are you aware that you've been doing this pra- kind of practice and that kind of practice? And as a result, he had multiple people that were not people. They were just something that was planted in his mind. Um, and as a result, um, he catered to it. Um, and it was a psychological term for it, actually. Um, you know, schizophrenic. Mm. As a result, he heard voices, yeah. but he saw the images. He interacted with these people, and they weren't there. Last years of his life, he was finally convinced that these people were not real. Huh. He had to intellectually um, sever his relationship with these people that were not there. And as a result, he ignored them. And they would try to stop him in every instant and say, hey, don't you see me? Why aren't you talking to me? Why aren't we social? Like, why aren't we friends? And as a result, he had to, for his own sanity and for the sanity uh, and impressions of his colleagues, he had to ignore the cravings he had to interact with these outside entities. Yeah. They, they, they made a movie about this uh, uh, many years ago. Yeah, there was one... Um... It's not recent, probably in the last 10 or 15 years. It was one, um, A Beautiful Mind with John Nash. Yeah. And it wasn't until later in his life, you know, most of the stuff that he experienced in his life never happened. It's like, yes. whoa. Exactly. <laughs> like, you know, that is you know, scary. There, is, there are some um, uh, theoretical physicists that will tell you that a lot of the things that you're experiencing – is not part of reality. It's not part of what we would review as reality. It's maybe your reality and how you are viewing it as reality, but the reality is it's not even there. It's not real. It's not tangible. Nobody else sees the experiences that you're going through. You're experiencing it as an individual. You're not seeing anything else that's really going on around you. It's kind of like interacting with the spiritual world. Okay? Uh, yeah. Those those of us who are very intuitive, who are very even clairvoyant to a point where they can actually interact with something that most people can't. Okay, they've gone, they made that step, and as a result, their their realm of reality or awareness is broadened to such a degree that they are the slim minority. Okay, they're not part of the of of the of the body of our society. Yeah. Uh, if people look at um, at what we do as a, you know, as, as, as a waste of time, because, you know, certain people will not acknowledge the real existence of the, of the spirit world or the real existence of demons. They won't until they need it. <laughs> it's like, uh, or until it touches <laughs> yeah. them. Yes. Yeah. You know, it, exactly. You know, yeah. And it is needed. You know, I mean, this type of work is needed. Um, because like you said earlier in the broadcast, we live in a supernatural world there is a lot of this world and a lot of part of our most of this universe is unseen unseen yeah. unfelt unrealized and whether we realize it or whether we ever capture a glimpse of it throughout our lifetime doesn't mean it doesn't exist yeah i i, I i'm just now becoming aware of quantum mechanics, you know, mm. and quantum ent- entanglement. Yeah. And going, whoa, you know, still looking at the proton, <laughs> at the atoms, and, and, and you hear the uh, uh, these things, and your whole mind is expanded into another form of reality. Um, 
that's really uh, really fascinating. It's interesting. Yeah. A lot of physicists will tell you that um, that there's no such thing as time. There's no time. Um, there's no there's no past. Um, there's no present, and there's no you know. I, of course, I'm not saying that I fully endorse this line of thought, but it's interesting that someone would bring it up um, and and. A, a majority of physicists will tell you that there that there is no time. Yeah. Time is an illusion. Okay, yeah, yeah. and uh, and I'm sure you've heard of that. It, it's very it's very interesting. We live in a very mysterious and, and mystery magical, uh, un- insane world. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah. and the more and the and the more we touch one another with thought, uh, and and seen in, in actions uh i like to think the more we we benefit our very presence our very being but you know it could go the other way too <laughs> yeah, so that's yeah. why that's why we do what we do yeah. yeah um what are um let's give a couple uh a takeaway or so for um for our audience tonight um as far as exorcisms um what do you want people to know tonight on Hints of hints of wisdom. Not not to be or not to call yourself an exorcist unless you've been called. Um, not to present yourself as an exorcist unless you've been trained. Um, there's a lot of charlatans out there that are motivated for money. They're motivated for other things in life, promoting themselves, whatever. Um, in my ministry, I've never asked for money. Everything I've done is for free, mm. um, and uh, it's it's something it's it's an old interesting but true. Um, if you really do something you love and you are called to do, money is not an issue. If you yeah. do something for money, then you'll never really be the the level of perfection that you like to feel you are. Okay, it's a false sense of 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 being called or being uh view yourself as as being that person uh the the call to guy if you will um my take is this okay um and again it really depends on your belief system but uh god is real creation is real uh darkness is real darkness is part of our world uh demonic entities are real yes mental health is also real but also tied into the darkness, so it all becomes one. Mm. Um, so it's, it depends on, on your perception. My perception in life is that uh, I'm in a state of amazement. I'm totally amazed. I can't believe I'm still seeing, I'm living in the futuristic world yeah. uh, of cell phones and uh, computers and, and seeing people from around the world in real time. I can't believe I, I I made it. I made it. I'm still far. I'm still waiting for the flying cars. I mean, they're oh, there, okay. but they're, they're yeah. Uh, I, I think that yeah, they're already there, but uh, they're they're going to be available soon. I'm yeah, sure. Not in abundance uh, yet. <laughs> oh yes, yes, yes. Teleporting is going to be a real scenario. They're going to somebody's going to, uh, which they probably already have some kind of apparatus that will actually take you from point A to point B, yeah. and uh, you know, and, and your molecules will be scattered up from one point. And, and shift to another point in seconds like around the world. I think that's going to happen. They already have um, a chip that uh, they could implant, which is scary, but they could implant in your brain, which will allow you access in the Internet. And they have these contact lenses um, that they've already designed that you can put the contact lenses in and just blink your eyes and you are wherever you want to be, okay, yeah. and even on the Internet. I mean... This technology is not no longer theory. It's it's already uh, they already have a working model of, of, of this whole scenario, which I can't believe that I'm around to witness it. <laughs> but here yeah. we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a um, it's an interesting world. It's an in- interesting era in in human history, and um, it's incredible. It's an incredible time to be alive, and to be a witness of it in it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, if, 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 providing I don't know how much time you actually have, but I, I could share it with you one of the most uh, interesting and most bizarre 
uh, rituals I had to go through, uh, which I actually performed, and but the aftermath. Uh, I'm still suffering from the aftermath. Mm. Do we have time? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, I did a, a ritual. It was an exorcism ritual, and it was the year uh, 2013. And this year was uh, an interesting year for me because this is the year I almost lost my life. Hmm. That is, my life was almost snatched away and taken from me. And uh, and every day I I look at and and realize that that could happen anytime, anyway, in any day. But back in 2013, I was in the middle of a ritual, and something invisible materialized, but still invisible, and decided to strike me with a two-by-four. This two-by-four was invisible, and oh, wow. I felt it on the side of my, my left side of my body. It hit my rib cage. Uh, three big blows. I'm in the middle of, of actually performing a ritual and I'm in the middle of prayer and it happened. It, it, my whole breath, I mean, just went right out of my entire system. I couldn't hardly breathe after the three bam, bam, bam. And you know, numbers are very significant too. Yeah. But when that happened, I keeled over. Couldn't catch my breath, but when I finally did, okay, and I'm in a room Again, I have a couple of assistants who are priests, and I have the room full of my investigators, and they were all, they were in shock because I dropped to the floor. They helped me up, and I inhaled, and exhaled, and silent prayer, and then I continue the ritual barely. Um, to make a long story short, and there is a, a long story to this, um, I was successful in doing what we were all set out to do, and that was to relieve this individual. Um, and as I left, I could barely breathe. I was inhaling in and out, and it took an effort to do. Uh, oh, my gosh, I was in such bad shape. Um, so I was driven to my place of residence. I called my family physician. I told them what, what the symptoms are. You know, I'm breathing. My breathing is, you know... Anyway, he encouraged me to go to the emergency room, have an x-ray done, have, you know, all the other tests, a, a, a body scan, the whole nine yards. And they immediately uh, admitted me into the hospital. And I was in the hospital uh, under kept intensive care for 30 days. Oh. I had three procedures. I had three procedures done. Um, I can tell you the name of the hospital, San Antonio uh, Regional Hospital in Upland, California. Great hospital. I mean, uh, I was there. I was uh, isolated for two weeks, the first two weeks, because they had no idea how I succumbed to this condition. What they found was a sack, a sack of blood that was wrapped around my heart. And this yeah. sack had two liters, two liters of blood that was tied and, and, and literally, and it was exactly the same area where I was struck by that visible two by four. Yeah. And uh, they had the drain the blood and remove the sack and then they call the cd uh, c uh, physician from their department because they had no idea what this could be they put me in a contamination you know uh, uh room and i was there for two weeks and they were examining me and, and going through the whole nine yards uh, I, they removed that they also did a procedure which i never heard of uh, they raked uh cleaned my lungs oh. uh, I don't know what that was about, but maybe that was tied into the sack, you know, that yeah. they found. They were trying everything. They put me on all kinds of medication. And I think, in my opinion, it was trial and error. They wanted to see what would work and what wouldn't work, you know, how I would react to certain medications. Yeah. Uh, I had three procedures while I was there, and I was released uh, 30 days later. And as a result, there was a residual that took place. Now, some people say that uh, they theorize that it could have been the the aftermath of the medications I was on because I was doing like 60, 70 medications a day, Whoa. different medications a day. <laughs> so, you know, everything that you put into your body that's foreign, okay, your body reacts, okay, mm -hmm. whether you're positive or negative. The physicians always say, well, you know, the positives outweigh the negatives, but still, you still have the negatives, okay. Um, since that time, I've had, um, I've had issues, uh, uh, walking issues. I've had um, issues... Uh, with um, bodily 
cramps, uh, muscle contractions, even to yeah. this day. And what they are are attacks. I believe they're dark attacks that are coming in. And these are all the the, the residuals that I uh, received after the rituals of exorcisms. I've yeah. done, I won't even tell you the amount of exorcisms I've done in 46 years, but it's a lot. Mind-boggling. And as a result, um, and this includes my assessments, my demonic assessments I've done. Um, and um, I can share one more quick story with you if you have time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the demons, like angels and God, they are outside our time and space. So in other words, one second in God's space could be 10,000 years in our time because we're oh. in time. All these entities are outside our time and space. So are the demons. So are the angels. Um, this happened when a report was submitted to my attention. And it was done 30 days. It was done 30 days ago. So it's a month old. The mm -hmm. assessment report is a month old. So I have the assessment report. I have the psychological report. I have the video that was recorded and taken. And I'm looking at my screen and I study everything in regards to assessing, trying to assess a, a particular situation, um, a case, whatever it might be. So I'm looking at my computer screen, okay? And uh, I, I've told the story before because it's really worth telling because it's, it's so incredible. I'm looking at the screen, and I'm studying the notes that the investigators have taken and, and some of the clergy, and so I'm looking at the screen, studying it, and I'm watching the first contact interview that one of our investigators are making, and he's following our questionnaire which is 60 questions, okay, and regarding his mental, uh, physical, and, and manifestations that, you know, that they are claiming and witnessing. So I'm looking at the interview, and as I'm looking, I notice something on the screen, and it looked like a black dot, tiny <laughs> black dot, and it was traveling very slowly across the screen. So as I see it, it's very slowly across the screen, I figured, well, you know, it's one of those uh, uh, technical, you know, issues. Maybe it was a part of the video or whatever, you know, uh, yeah. technical glitch, if you will. I saw the same dot go very slowly again. I'm still ignoring it because I'm thinking it's a, it's a technical glitch, you know, in the recording. And it went to the other side of the screen. Now it's starting to make a third round. And the little speck is becoming more of a fuzzball. And the fuzz ball is about the size of a quarter. And it's going from one end of the screen to the other very slow. It, now, at this point, it has my attention. Okay, this is about the fourth time it's going from one side to the other. And I'm starting to notice it and uh, putting my focus on this black fuzz. The black fuzz kept going from one end of the screen to the other very slowly. And I'm looking at it. And keep in mind, okay, this... This video, this this uh, this recording was done a month ago. <laughs> I'm looking at this fuzz and I'm saying, well, you know, it's still, I, I can't explain at this point. So I put my face closest to the to the screen of my computer to to yeah. really examine it, and it started going again slowly, and then all of a sudden it slows down and it stops right at the center of the screen, and I'm looking at it and I'm saying, what the heck? I, take my glasses off you know i go <laughs> further going what the heck is that and sure enough it stopped it started pulsating and then i felt it it was the energy coming from the screen it literally pushed me from my chest way back to my chair my chair has wheels and i'm going for one second i'm telling the story and i'm feeling the pain already <laughs> uh, it's a part of that residual thing i was telling you about yeah I'm, I'm, for a second, I'm saying, I'm saying, what the heck just happened? I mean, in all the years I'm doing this, I, I've never, I mean, I've, I've viewed thousands upon thousands of demonic assessments and investigations, and I've never had this type of sensation happen. What the heck? Yeah. It's a surge of energy that came from the tube, and then it came to me. I realized what was going on. What I was witnessing was something that happened in real time. I was there 30 days ago, but not really. 
I was there in regards to witnessing what took place. The Black Fuzz was actually a demonic entity that was part and took part of, of the whole control of the actual environment, mm. the physical environment, and became manifested in the, that very second. Since it's, out time, it's outside of time and space, we're talking about um, they have the ability to walk from one area to another in a matter of seconds, which could be, in this case, 30 days. Yeah. So I'm watching the demonic in real time, and it's watching me. It's watching my reaction. It's watching uh, and probably get, being entertained, okay, uh, in regards to my confusion at that very moment. And yeah. then I realized that it came to me. What I was watching, even though it was taken 30 days ago, it was all of a sudden in real time. That demonic entity was there, and it attacked me as if I was there 30 days wow. ago. And man, uh, it left uh, an imprint, it left a print on me, which I have taken a picture of, and it's on my Facebook page somewhere. Uh, I have, you know, I, as you probably yeah. know, I, I have like these nine or ten forums, and I share this information with all you know the people who are involved in our uh, in our Facebook forums. Anyway, um, this was um, a real happening, and probably one of the most scariest things that I have actually witnessed because it was out of my control. I had, of course, I do, and the thing that I do is I am a profile. I observe, okay, everything. I observe it. I look at it at a critical eye. And yeah. because of that, the darkness used that moment to break my my defenses and to come and to project itself into the screen in real time and made me part of what that scenario was all about. And... uh yeah, yeah. natural is real, and and that is very very real. Have have you ever have you ever had the thought that you know you're kind of like uh, you're kind of like the CIA agent, CIA agent or FBI agent, and the, the, the demons are the bad guys, obviously, but and you're you're the threat to their mission. Oh yeah, yeah. I I always feel that uh, yeah. sense. In fact, everyone who does what I do. Yeah. And who have been called to do this, we are like the uh, targets. Yeah, that enemy are, number one. <laughs> it, it's, uh, we're, we're, I mean, look at it from, um, from a military perspective, okay? We who do this are the generals, yeah. okay? If you are in the, the military, you know the best target in terms of your enemy should be the general who runs all the other foot soldiers. And so you want to go, we want to put your aim and your target at the, at the main person who's calling the shots. Yeah. Because in my case, it's God, God is calling the shots. I, and I'm just, you know, I, I'm just really nobody, but I'm, I'm being used as a vessel here yeah. to do what we do. But just think if our enemy can take me out and I touch the lives of many people over the years, uh, and to think to take that away would be a great victory. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's not only real, but I, I've been in the hospital. I've been attacked, and I've been I can attest to the fact that uh, that the people that know me and who have witnessed it can also tell you, and people who have who have uh, uh, ministries of exorcisms and it's part of their church, they could also attest to the fact. And I'm not just talking about Catholics. I'm talking about every denomination that acknowledges yeah. that there is a bad and good and evil and there's, you know, there's God. So, I mean, you know, there's light and darkness. It's always all around us. And those of us who acknowledge that, uh, we put ourselves into that scenario. And that's fine because uh, we have a very strong belief system in place. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's how, that's how we connect, you know, uh, especially you and I, it, it's, uh, you know, cause I've, 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 I've had these experiences as well. Not, not at the level that you have, but, um, knowing through those experiences that, yeah, it, it is real. And, um, we're, we're the, uh, we're the light workers trying yeah. to help the rest of mankind and our spirit, the human spirit survive move That's forward right. and, and um, battle this war, the spiritual war. 
continuously. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, at the end of the broadcast, but um welcome back anytime. And uh I might I might um might consider um going through one of your courses too as far as the profiling and stuff like that yeah. as as I move uh the future yeah, as we move uh, into the future and stuff like that. And um, for those out there who are interested, definitely check it out. St. Michael's Seminary Studies of Assessment Science dot com. Um, that's a long that's a long website. Yes, but definitely yes. check it out in the uh, in the description below um, on the YouTube channel. And um, other than that, um, we went a little over, but hey, it's uh, this is a topic that is always always interesting to listen to and always interesting to talk about mm-hmm. so and to um to uh create these reinforcements and knowledge uh for people to uh um you know mm-hmm. be aware of so absolutely yep. archbishop ron thank you very much brother sure thank you very much blessings my friend god bless thank you and, and you uh, too let's Thank you. Let's keep in touch. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for watching the Conscious, Conscious Radio Network's The Seance. And until next time, we will see you. Where's my mouse? There we go. Ah, we will see you next week. <laughs>